So well, it, it, it certainly looks like uh, what I think some people have identified as Cadrosaurus. Yes. On the surface, just like a snake and so flexible back and, uh, they said and a funny looking head. What I read was it's an ambush predator and um, because it can't move at high speeds ah. and very, very aggressive. Right, uh, kind of like a barracuda. <laughs> yeah, and they, 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 they are it, it, in, in big schools too. You know, Yogi from the uh, International Fisheries Trust, he said he'd only seen one or two washed up on beaches. He'd never seen a live one. And he's he's a longtime fisheries biologist. I've never seen Anyway, it. it's, it's 10 o'clock. We should probably start. So... I've uh, started the recording. Um, so we're going to do booby today, for me anyway. And I'll tie this guy. It's, it's kind of like what they call a tequila booby. Um, but you can tie them in different sizes and configurations. So this is one that doesn't have the big collar. And it's kind of a medium-sized one. And then there's these little guys, which are just teeny little eyes and a little bit of marabou. Um, I think the ones that most people use are the, are the larger ones around here. And uh, here's another one that's just different colors. So I'll tie the big one to start with. And for that, I'm, I'm gonna use a, about a three X long. This one's a size eight hook. Get that in the vise. I'm going to use a, a black thread just for the living heck of it. I happen to have it handy. The first thing I'm going to do is uh, start the thread. And I'm going to dress the hook back to about a quarter of the length of the hook. And then I'm going to bring the thread back up. I'd say about a quarter inch or so behind the eye of the hook. This is where I'm going to tie in the foam for the booby eyes. Now, the, the foam comes in a variety of different arrangements. Um, you can buy preformed eyes like these guys here that look like little dumbbells. Let's see if I can get one so you can actually see it. It's got a little waist in the middle. You can get those in different sizes, but they're pretty pricey. The other way you can get them is you can get them in foam cylinders that uh, come in a bag like that. And they come in a couple of different diameters. Um, so this one, I'm going to use the commercial grade one and it, it it's a little uh, longer than than what uh, what because it comes in a longer length and you only want it to be uh, sort of gap width on either side of the hook. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tie this thing on to the hook at that point, leaving a little space between the foam cylinder and the eye of the hook. I'm going to go from back to front diagonally over the foam onto the hook shank and cinch it down then underneath and do the same thing where your thread is almost parallel to the hook shank from one side to the other front to back, but almost parallel to the hook shank. And I'm gonna cinch that down pretty good. Now, there's a tendency of these things to spin around the hook. And the answer to that is super glue. So I'm going to take a little bit of super glue and I'm going to put some on the thread here and a little bit underneath. And then I'm going to wrap some more wraps to a couple over this way and a couple this way. And that carries the super glue down onto the shank of the hook and it uh, keeps them from turning. And I'm just going to snip off this long end here 
to about the same length as the other side to kind of even them up. So there's my booby eyes tied on the hook. Cinch down like some more, a little more cinching down here. Then I'm gonna take the uh, thread back all the way down the hook shank to where the barb was before it got flattened. And then I'm gonna put some flash in. Now on these bigger ones, I will use a, a thicker flash and wherever I put it. The stuff that I've been using lately is uh, where did it go? Oh. This stuff is, is really quite new. So it's called lateral scale. And it's like uh, flashaboo, but it's it's got uh, it's got little ripples in it. It just gives a little more uh, a little more uh, glisten to it. I'm gonna take a piece of that out of this package. Just Pull it out the side here. Mm -hmm. Before that tied on the hook, I'm going to start the body. And the body at the back is going to be marabou. And the trick with this marabou is to take the stuff off the side of the pick plume. And the way I do it is I give it a little pull and then wrap down. So as you pull it off the stem, you're kind of folding it over the previous little bit that you've pulled off the stem. Kind of rolling it down the stem as you get it off. And then you end up with a nicely formed bunch of marabou. And I'm going to then tie that onto the hook shank right there. And I don't want the tail to be too long. Because if it gets too long, there's a tendency for the marabou to wrap around the bend of the hook. And I think you also end up getting some short strikes. Wrap up the body of the fly. And then I'm going to take that little piece of oh, flash of wherever it went. As well organized today as I usually am. Get another one out here. Um, hey, what size is that hook? That's a size eight. Three to two X to three X. Two, yeah, I think that's a two X long. What's your normal size you use? That's what I would use, six to eight. I don't use, like, you, if you're going to tie it smaller, um, you're going to find it difficult to get that gel spun head on it. Uh, so anyway, I'm going to take this, uh, this flash, and I'm just going to fold it around the, the thread. Bring it up and set it on top of the hook wrap it down and then I'm going to try and get one strand of it on the near side of the hook and one strand on the far side. So there's the one on the far side and there's the one on the near side. And slightly on top so that they're not going to sag down too much. Then I'm going to lift them up and, and trim them off about the same length as the green marabou. Then I'm going to get some more of the green marabou. And I'm going to pull some of that off. And I'm going to lay that on top. Dave, can you play around with the, uh, the color of the flashaboo? Sure, I don't see why not. I like this this lateral stuff. Is it's got a little because it's got a crinkle to it. It it just gives a little more. Now you can use 
a variety of different material for that flash, wherever it went. Looks like one piece kind of disappeared in there somewhere. Oh well. There's nothing, nothing particularly requiring a great deal of tying skill here for these things. So yeah, there's that other piece in there, but flash it, it's right there. And then for the body, we're using this uh, gel core fritz, which comes in a raft of different colors. Um, oh, and, and you can alternate the colors of marabou too, if you want. There's some light orange, I got some purple. And you can mix and match colors. I think, I don't think there's anything critical with these flies. I think it's uh, whatever you can make work. Now this gel front, gel, gel core fritz is like a little rope that's got this uh, stuff that sticks out the side. What I'm gonna do is take a little piece of it I'm going to see if I can expose the core, which doesn't really want to. Let's see if we get it off this end. There we go. So we expose the core so that we can tie just the core down on the body there. Can see I'm going to need more super glue under those eyes. And then I'm going to take this uh, stuff and just wrap it around the shank of the hook. And if I give it a little bit of a twist as I do, what I'm doing is I'm wrapping the, the core of this stuff right next to the hook shank and leaving the, the, the fritzy part to stick straight out. So it requires you to make kind of a little half twist every time you go through. You gotta make sure that that core goes right next to the hook shank. And as soon as I get up to those eyes, I'm gonna bring the thread up and tie it down. A few wraps in behind and then a couple of wraps in front. And then I'm just going to snip that clean. Yep. Then thread in front. Now, once again, I think what I'm going to do here to keep this uh, these eyes from spinning. Again, I'm going to get my super glue in there underneath, and see if I can get a dab of super glue right underneath there. Get a few more wraps of thread in right through the super glue. And what that's going to do is hopefully have those eyes underneath there so they're not going to spin anymore. Now we were talking whip finishers. And uh, I think we'll we'll take a minute here to, to look at them. Let's finish. Got a variety. The first one that I worked with was these guys. This is a, a Thompson style wood finisher. And that's the bigger version. And I have also have a, a smaller version here. And the way these guys work is you hook the thread the spring part, you lay the, the thread that's on the, the spool in the little V and, and then hook the hook around the thread and bring it up and wrap it around the eye. Um, actually, sometimes it's better if you invert it. I don't use this particular version very often. But once you do that, then you just 
lay that thing around and you spin it around the hook a few times. Flick the gizmo out of the way and pull it tight. That's the Thompson. The one most people use is the Mattarelli, which is this guy here. And what you do is you hook the thread, you bring the thread around the, the bent part here and lay the thread from, the, from your bobbin along the hook shank and then just spin the thing around. And then when you're ready to finish, you push forward to get it loose at the back and then pull with the spool, the bobbin, and that pulls it up. And then the third one is the nicest one, I think. It's made by Mark Pettijohn. It's not cheap. But again, it's hook the thread, lay the thread into this little hook. Oops, sorry. Ah. Just lay it in and then lay it up and go around, two, three, flip the thing out of the way and pull. Now the last thing you guys were interested in was the hand finish. What I do with that is I hold the bobbin straight up with the thread going straight up. Take my right hand, take the, fig, the two, first two fingers, lay them across the thread, palm out, bring the bobbin down on the near side towards the hook shank, right behind the eye, and turn my hand over so that the thread from the bobbin goes around the eye. And then I use the one finger to push the thread over and the other finger to pull the thread under. So that's the second finger over, the first finger under. And what that does is that wraps that loose piece of thread around the eye of the hook. And you pull it tight and you're done. So that's the three or four different styles of whip finish. And if you're interested another day, we can run through the hand whip finisher again, or if you have questions on how to make any of these go. Now, the last thing I do before I finish is this is an artistic thing. I take a Sharpie and make sure it's ready. And I come in with my Sharpie and I make a little dot black dot right in the middle of that foam. So fine point Sharpie. And now I have a finished movie with a black eye. And that's that. There's your infamous booby fly. Dave, have you have you done any research as to whether it's more effective with the black eye or, or not? No, it's just that's to me. It's just a <laughs> just a uh, a personal thing. Yeah, because I've never <laughs> used the black eye, and I find the booby really effective. I, I I just like the look of it from the fisherman's perspective. <laughs> now, now, why if you get the... why do the fish take that fly? It doesn't look like anything they've ever seen before. Is that why? Uh, it doesn't think, make any sense. Well, I think it's an attractor. I think what one of the things is it's the action that the floating fly does when you're stripping or trolling it. If you get a little movement to it rather than just straight trolling, I think if you twitch the, the rod a little bit, it's going to go up and down in the water column, depending on where your line is, particularly with a sinking line. And I think it's that swimming motion like this that attracts them. But I, I think just the color is very visible. Um, who knows? It could Love be just, also works, doesn't it? It could just be a territorial thing, right? This is something that's in their territory that they they don't like. Is, is that color? Is that color uh, better than uh, say olive or uh, a dark a dark? I green? can tell you, I haven't I haven't used boobies a lot, but I I would tie them in a variety of colors and. Test them out, find out which works. Because, you know, fish don't always eat the same thing, right? <laughs> my, my experience is that the brighter colors work better. Yeah. I, I tied them up in different uh, different colors and olives and blacks and so on. And uh, 
I find that that color work is the most effective. Yeah, I think primarily they're in a tractor pattern. I mean, you know, the most effective spinning lure I've ever had in my life is the Len Thompson red and white. Now, why there's no fish that looks like a Len Thompson red and white lure, but I'll tell you, it's probably the most effective spinning lure I've ever used. From side from this big up to the big spoons, and uh, the company still makes them. I agree with you, Dave. That and the five of diamonds, and and the, and the that and the five of diamonds, and the company that makes them, their plant is just south of Edmonton. That's Daredevil, isn't it? No, it's Len Thompson. And 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 uh, you can actually do a plant tour. They'll show you where how they make them if you go. Go to go and see them. So there you go. That's my uh, contribution for the day. That Len Thompson you're talking about is very effective on steelhead too. Oh it yeah, used to be. Yeah, it's it's a very effect. I've probably in in terms of spinning, I probably spin fishing. I've caught more on Len Thompson's in a variety of different colors, but in particularly the red and white than anything else, any other spinning. Any you other know, spin. there's a subtlety in the red and white one too. Uh, there's a, yeah. a, a real red one and white, and then there's the kind of orangey reddish and white. I found the orangey reddish and white work better on the uh, Vancouver Island steelhead. Ah. Yeah. But it's, a, it's a little tricky to get, uh, but you can get it from the Len Thompson company. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're nice people. I, I've, I've, uh, we, well, I used to work for a, a municipal engineering firm and we used to do a, a little bit of municipal work in the town where they, they uh, have their plants. So we would always stop by and have coffee with them and have a chat about fishing. Mm -hmm. uh, really, really friendly folk. Uh -huh. And, and it's a, a very small business, but they do well. And they've been in business for a long time. Yeah. So Florin, it's your turn. All right, thank you. Well, oh, and, and as by way of introduction to this, uh, those of you who were in earlier, uh, we, we talked about, I, I was out fishing with Winky the other day on the couch and, and, and apparently Dave Locke was out there earlier in the morning and there was a hatch of uh, mayflies on, a huge hatch of mayflies on. There weren't a lot of fish around, but both uh, Winky and I managed to hook and promptly proceeded to lose a nice looking brown. And it was on a Royal, Royal Coachman wet fly which is similar to the, the March brown that you're going to tie, Florin. And I'm sure that's exactly what the species was. I'm sure it was the Rithrogena that was hatching. Right. So I'm in the process of uh, doing a little write-up about this thing. There's a lot of information about these flies. And incidentally, the traditional English March brown it is in the same genus as the Western March brown. The Eastern and Midwestern ones are slightly different beast. They're in the same family, but they're in, a, they're in different genera. And there is also a little bit of confusion there because there's been some reclassification that happened not that long ago. So depending on what age your books are, uh, they're going to have names that you're not going to recognize. So this is just the, the biology of it. There are primarily three species apparently of importance in the West. And opinions are somewhat divided as to how exactly they, they emerge. So these are fast water um, nymphs that, that cling to the bottom. So these are the clingers. Um, they're also known as flat-headed mayflies. And some people say that they do emerge at the bottom and basically the dun with wings somewhat crumpled and folded is swimming to the surface. And some say no, they first move to slow water and then they 
emerge the usual way at the surface, okay? And the dressing that I'm going to do is going to be somewhere in this range, in the 12 to 16 range, the 12 and 14 being the early stuff. And later in the season, there is a species that goes to a smaller size, like a 16. Um, there's lots of information on these. And the most beautiful pictures that I've seen are here, there are some excerpts. I'm going to post this later. There are some excerpts from um, British classics, beginning with Thixton in 1862. That flies older than that, actually. Um, it gives this for March 15th. You know, there are these books with kind of like a fishing calendar in them. Um, and then there's Pritt that gives two dressings. Um, and the feathers kind of seem to vary, you know, to various brown things, right? So uh, Pritt goes for, uh, for Woodcock for this thing. And then there is Edmonds and Lee in 1916. And they go for the, for the snipe um, rump as the, as the dress, as the key part of the, of the dressing. All of them share this, this orange silk, not too bright, which can be nicely matched by two of the uni colors. One of them being the um, rust brown and the other one being the orange. Uh, if you're lucky to have some old pearsols kicking around, it would have to be shade 6A to match what I've seen in various, uh, various books. Anyway, um, there's a list of references where you find more information about these things. Um, there's the mayflies, Knop and Cormier. And that's kind of a bit of a standard reference. Um, and then very, very nice pictures. The one thing that's not in most of these books is really good pictures of the bugs. And there's this relatively recent title by a fellow named Arlen Thomason. And the title is Bug Water. And it has a whole chapter on the March Brown with a very nice sequence of an emerging fly, among other things. Um, the guy, I think he retired on the banks of some river in Oregon. And so he just started taking fantastic pictures of the, uh, of the flies in his backyard. Um, so if you want to see very close up what the nymphs and the, uh, the duns of these things look like that's a good place to look, okay? Now the March brown wet fly, which is what I'm looking at here. Now these being clingers, the thing is that fishing the nymph is a bit of a waste of time because these nymphs, they're not actively uh, moving around in the drift. They're clinging to rocks, and the only times they become available to the trout is when the fly is um, is emerging. So that's the the part of the theory that justifies why you'd fish a wet fly for these uh, for these hatches. Now this is a bit of a multi-purpose fly as well because many people fly these um, wet March browns for uh, caddis hatches. So match, match the size and fish the same thing or a partridge and orange. That's a very effective thing with, uh, with caddis flies as well, okay? Um, there are versions of this fly. So this is the winged version. There are also spider versions of this, which really means is the same fly minus the wing, okay? And I've done, um, last summer, I've done a version of this that used partridge tail as both the tail of the fly and the wing. These are really beautiful speckled, uh, speckled feathers. They're not very, very easy to come by. You'd have to mail order them from somewhere. Shops, as far as I am aware, never stock the stuff, but this is an option. Another feather that I've seen listed as something to use when doing the tails on this fly is bronze mallard, of which I have a sample here and which I'm going to be using today. Again, you get this really nice fine barring that shows like the segmentation on the tails of the natural. 
So this is beautiful stuff to use. I found I have some, uh, a few feathers of pintail, actually. So I think a trip to the Esquimalt Lagoon and a quick, careful look on the shoreline might yield some feathers occasionally. These things are also very fine, very fine barring. The, the color is veering a little bit more towards the, towards pink. There's just a light touch of pink in these feathers. Very nice, uh, very nice stuff. I'm going to try them as well. Okay, so these are the key materials. The other thing that is used, so you can do one with partridge wing and tail like I did last year. The other thing that is being used for, for wings, and if you want to see how an expert would do it, just go and watch Davy McPhail using, um, these are feathers from the wing of a hen pheasant. At some point, hen pheasants were readily available. I think all these birds have disappeared from shops for some reason, um, but I, I do have a, a whole hen pheasant skin kicking around, then I have a few feathers and they look absolutely beautiful. Okay, so let's, uh, let's see how this is done. And oh, for the body as well, this one is with mylar tinsel uh, with some um, gold, fine gold thread on top. The alternatives are to use some dubbing of some sort and whatever you like for the ribbing, including, as I did on this fly, a little bit of yellow silk. Okay. So I'm going to do on a size 12, which is the largest size recommended if you're going for flying this, uh, fishing this fly for the uh, retrogena, so the, the actual March brown fly. Okay, so I'm going to do this one with the with the uni a dot orange. So I'll dress the hook with a bit of thread. And get some material for tail. Now, it doesn't take an awful lot. You just want a few fibers from the mallard. And the reason I'm, I'm calling here for, for bronze mallard is because you get this really nice brownish color rather than the, the, plain, the plain gray, which does match the, the color of the naturals quite well. And it's a, it's a pretty good buggy color as well. So measure, these things have fairly long tails. So it's safe to measure your tails about the length of the hook shank or even a little bit longer. Couple of soft loops. And I've got the tail attached here. And then what I'm going to need is a little bit of rib. And one of the things that I like to use- Oh, and what color is that thread? I'm sorry? What color is the thread? It's the uni orange. Okay. The, uh, the pure soles is a little bit of a brighter tint than this. Now for, for ribbing, one of the things that I like to use when I do flies that are not too big is I bought many years ago a spool, this was in a fabric store, a spool of metallic thread that's fairly fine and it's gold. And it's basically just like a fine gold tinsel at the fraction of the cost you would pay for the uh, appropriate fly tying product. And it works well. You just have to be careful that when you attach it, the um, gold coating, which is just like some very fine uh, 
metallic stuff that's on top of the thread doesn't get separated from the core. Okay. And now for the body, what I'm going to use is some dubbing. Now for dubbing, um, just good old plain hair's ear in a slightly darker, this is a homemade one that came from stripping a full mask and blending the, blending the hairs. You can, you know, try to blend in a little bit of sparkly, sparkly fiber if you want more of a greenish tinge to the body, although the bodies are brown. Um, just a few fibers of yellow sparkle is going to give you a greenish um, tinge. There is a bit of pink in some of these things, um, and some people like to add a bit of reddish in the thorax. Um, this is a dubbing mix with a bit of pink that I could switch for when I do the thorax. So there is a lot of room to play here with, with, with various, uh, various ideas. I fish this thing also in much larger sizes, like eights and tens, um, on the high mountain streams when there's still green drakes around. And I use this um, greenish, um, greenish sparkly dubbing and uh, the fly work well. So it's, uh, it's quite an adaptable, quite an adaptable design. Okay. So build a dubbed body. Then rib. The gold thread. Now for the front of the fly, we need legs, which are just regular partridge. So I have some already stripped partridge hackles. I just dip in here and select a feather <clears throat> and tie it on. And with these, of course, these fibers are fairly long. And the challenge with, with partridge is that it's, it's very nice stuff, but it's delicate generally. And you want fibers that match the hook size. So the trick here is to grab it with something. So hackle pliers would do, and then try to fold back a little bit the fibers on the feather as close to the tip as you can get without tearing the feather apart. Okay, so maybe I can, I'll see. I hope I'm not getting too greedy here. Just fold back a little bit more. And once I've done that, I'm going to tie this feather in by the tip. So I have the fiber separated back there. I know it's going to be a little less visible because my fingers will get in the way. So I hold the pretty side of the feather towards me and I attach it by the tip. Whoops. It's a little too close to the eye of the hook. Okay. 
I have a little bit of fibers sticking to the front, which I don't want. Just trim those away. And make sure that the feather is well secured. I'm going to also use hackle pliers. Just I find it's a lot easier to handle the feather if I did that. Okay. So now what I want to do, so I have the feather in position. Now I want to fold the fibers towards the back of the hook as I wrap the feather around. Gently, don't pull too hard, just enough to keep the whole thing under tension. If fibers get caught, just don't worry about it, go back a bit more. Stroking gently towards the back and they should fall just nicely. Okay. And that's about a couple of turns. That's all I want. And keep ah, this one is a is not a very cooperative feather. <laughs> oh well. Okay, just a couple of red turns to secure the hackle. And then just slide the scissors in here and trim the rest. Okay, looks a little messy, no problem. Just grab the fibers push them back and do a little bit of tidying up here. I can see there's still a fiber sticking out here. Okay. I think I went a little too far back. Don't want that. Okay, now I'm going to get the hen feathers. So I have a matched pairs as well as I could match them. And I've seen various methods for, for doing this, but what I found worked for me was the following. And I don't know how well I can show this on camera, but you want two slips of feather that are as well matched with one another. So what I'm doing here is I took both feathers, I lined them up, and this is the section where I'm going to, to get my wing segments from, okay? And what I do is I'm going to hold the two feathers together between my fingers of the left hand, because I'm right-handed, and I'm going to grab at the same time a slip from each of the two feathers, right? And I'm going to pull on both of them at the same time. Just rip them off the feathers, okay? So now they came off and they're in my right hand. And you can see the little curly ends where I ripped the fibers off the feather, right? So this is what, what I've got. It looks like this and it's two segments of hen wing, basically quite well matched right? So I don't have to worry about, I find that personally handling these feathers as separate slips and then putting them together, it's something I have yet to, uh, to learn how to do. Okay, and then I'm going to measure this wing. I don't want it to go too much past the bend of the hook. 
I'm going to transfer it to the fingers of my left hand, and then I'm going to do a couple of soft loops here. And I have to do this blindly and hope that you're not slipping off the hook. It happens. I, I have a bad feeling that this is, so it is attached now, but it's not in the right place. Okay. Now also keep in mind that if you're doing an emerger, you don't want a wing that's too large. So personally, I think going here with a slightly smaller wing is not a bad idea. And then a few tidy up wraps and the whip finish. And then a second whip finish. And that's the fly. It looks buggy. It looks brown. The wing is on top, as it should be. The partridge is maybe a little bit too long. But I think in the swift current, it won't matter that much. It's got all the moving parts. And those flies are meant to catch fish, not be pretty, eh? Well, they're also, if you tie them right, they can be very pretty. I'm just teasing you. <laughs> they you, can be that's very like pretty, Maya. but it's, um, it's a little bit harder. And what I was doing here also, I was, uh, I turned off one of the lights so it doesn't kind of kill the camera. Because once I, once I turned the light on properly, um, you, you can't see very well. So I was doing this a little bit in the dark, which is, uh, I have to say, a bit of a challenge. Those yeah. flies are, are effective in still water too. I've, yes, I have. I've had great success with them on Durant's Lake. Yeah. Do you do the winged versions or do you do a simplified version of it? Do a simplified version. And I just use a couple of uh, some uh, pheasant tail uh, fibers for the wing. Oh, okay. Yeah, you can also use, I think the, um, this one is actually easier to get. You can buy um, hen tails and they're a little bit softer. <clears throat> if you don't want too, too heavy of a wing, yeah. Uh, Jim McDonald was the one who put us on to using the pheasant, uh, pheasant for, uh, for the wing. It works really well, it's nice and simple. Yeah, and it's it's readily available too. Uh, what I also had luck on on Stillwater was uh, with just partridge and orange in small sizes, like sixteens, that kind of stuff. Um, it it may work for midges. It may work for all kinds of things. And that's the uh, fly tying. I should stop the, okay. I should stop the vice here. Okay, thanks, Florin. Mm -hmm.